you probably want to know about the certification itself, the process to get certified and the certificate itself. Um, so you download a product certificate from the Exeter website and you're trying to understand the information documented in that certificate. You also want to know what stands behind the certificate and what's involved in the certified, certifying of the product. Um, a manufacturer whose product passes the Exeter IEC 61508 assessment scheme will receive a certificate based on IEC 61508 or perhaps other um, functional safety standards. There is a significant amount of information on the certificate itself. And sometimes it's a little important, but sometimes it's very important. And so you should be able to look and extract different pieces of information from the certificate itself and know what to look for. This document explains how one should use and also interpret the um, Exeter certificate. So it's important that a user understands that the certificate does not stand by itself. The certificate is supported and detailed by an assessment report. So for each product that is certified by Exeter and the certi certification is still valid, <laughs> Exeter posts both the certificate and the assessment report on our SAEL, or the Safety Automation Element List, which can be found on the Exeter website. So a little bit about me. My name is Lauren Stewart. I'm a CFSP. And those of you might know, um, that's a Certified Functional Safety Professional. I graduated from Virginia Tech with a BSME. And I have over five years of professional experience. I started in custom design and manufacture, and now I work for Exeter um, as, a, um, as a safety engineer, focusing on the mechanical aspects and of Exeter's customers. So along with assessing the safety products and certifications, um, I am doing research and publishing reports on stiction and engineering ethics and doing a 2H initiative database, so we are able to do both 1H and 2H certifications according to IEC 61508. A little bit about who we are. Um, we are worldwide functional safety and security experts. As you can see, we have offices all over the world, so no matter where you are or where your customers are, we can be there for you and support you. Um, Exeter, we have four main industry focuses. We have our OEM side, our system designer side, our end user and engineering contracting side. For each one of these um, industry focuses, we have different um, tools and also different expertise to help you and your customers. A little about our main products and service categories. We have consulting, we have engineering tools, which I just mentioned. We have product certification, and that's what we're going to be spending most of our time talking about today. So we have our functional safety, or IEC 61508 certification. But we also have um, cybersecurity control systems and network robustness um, certifications. We also do training. We do training on a bunch of different topics. Um, I, we can come to you, you can come to us. It depends on how many people you have um, or what you need. We will tailor it to you. We also have reference materials. We have databases, tutorials, textbooks, market studies, anything you need. And finally, we have our professional certification, our CFSE and CFSP programs, which I mentioned earlier. A little bit about our products. We have our facts or process hazard analysis and hazard and operability studies software. We have our Excellentia software, which is SIL verification, SIL selection, SRS, and proof test generator. We have our SERH viewer, which is safety equipment reliability database, and our SIL alarm software, which is alarm rationalization, 
and master alarm database. And finally, one of our newest products is SILSTAT. And SILSTAT is a field data collection tool. So if there is a field failure event, we are able to take that event and create a database and maintain that. This database is, um, it can import data from other Excellentia applications and it is used, um, it's a data analysis service using Exodus predictive analytics and its output reports are compatible with PERT. Um, a little bit about our reference material. We like to brag a little bit and show you all of the books that we have authored and co-authored. We are the industry leaders in reference materials for the automation and safety and reliability books. So finally, about what we're going to get into today. The topics we are discussing. Um, we're going to start out with what happens in an Exodus certification. We are then going to look at the certificate itself and break it apart into sections. We're going to look at the scope, assessment level, revision, and expiration. The next section of the certificate, we're going to break apart the main conformity declaration. Then we're going to look at the certificate template and the failure rates and supporting documentation. We're going to then look at different examples of certificates and how you can interpret the certificates themselves. Then how you can look and know if a certificate is valid or not and what you should get off of that. And finally, we're going to wrap it up with how the Exodus certificate relates to compliance. So let's start off with what happens in an Exodus certification. I'm going to be giving you a Reader Digest version of the step-by-step -step, um, process of product certification since we have so much to cover today. We have more in-depth blogs and webinars about the certification project process, so if you'd like to know more about that, you can look on our website or you can email me and I'll get you more information on it. So the first step is a kickoff meeting. The Exeter project engineer will conduct a kickoff meeting to review the steps that will be taken to achieve the certification. This is typically done via um, the internet meeting or a conference call. Every once in a while we will um, do go ahead and go on site and explain everything. After our kickoff meeting, the first step in the actual certification is to perform an FMEDA analysis on the product. So what is an FMEDA? It's a detailed failure mode, effects, and diagnostic analysis, and it is a technique used to evaluate the reliability and the safety integrity of a given product. The results of a FMEDA analysis are a set of failure rates and useful life that can be used to determine the product and overall SIF of a probability of failure. Once we have the FAMIDA done and we have the failure rates in useful life, we then go on to step three, which is a creation of the proven and use analysis. For existing products and products that um, have been out on the market for a while, an Exeter engineer will review in detail the shipping and returns history of the products. The Exeter engineer will evaluate the existing return process the details of the failure analysis and document how the existing product has been sufficiently free of defects to be utilized in a safety related application. Once the proven and use analysis is finished, we go on to the process analysis. The process analysis is an initial step where the Exeda engineer will typically review the customer's quality management system procedure. Once it has been established that the quality management system procedures are compliant to IEC 61508, um, a baseline safety case is created. It is assumed that the product has the same design and development procedures 
as the quality management system procedures um, dictates. The basis of the IEC 61508 certification of the customer's product is detailed in the safety case itself. And on the basis of the process analysis, the Exida engineer will populate the safety case using the Exida software of safety case DB tool. Once we have um, a baseline safety case created, we then go ahead and do an on-site audit. And when all the process gap issues have been addressed, um, an on-site audit meeting is scheduled. This on-site audit meeting is expected to be conducted over one to two days. And during the visit, the Exida engineer will review existing development procedures in detail and interview the respective responsible parties to discover how the process has been applied to the product that is being certified. And this information is then entered into the safety case along with the initial information. And if there are any audit findings, we used to um, send out a gap report, but we found it more helpful to send out an action item list. And all of the action items will discuss how, where the gaps between IEC 61508 and the product or the process um, is. So you can just go ahead and go down the action item list. And once all of the check marks are finalized, we can go on to step six, which is the certification audit. So once the evaluating assessor is satisfied that all of the gaps or the action items have been fulfilled, an, an Exodus certification assessor will review the safety case to determine that all the requirements have been met and the evidence documents exist. So once the certifying assessor is satisfied that the requirements have been made, either the evaluating assessor or the certifying assessor will go ahead and create an assessment report and the certificate. And we, that's where we're going to be doing our main portion of today's um, webinar is looking at the certificate itself. So once again, as I said in the beginning, it's important to understand that this certificate does not stand alone and it's not just a piece of paper and that's all you have to look at. The certificate is supported by a detailed assessment report and for each product that is um, certified by Exeda, Exeda posts both the certificate and the assessment report on the SAEL website. So the certificate, I'm showing you the certificate template right here. The certificate template has a front and the back. And it is broken down into four main sections. You start with the front of the certificate, which is on the left-hand side. And you have the gray area and you have the white area. The gray area is broken down into the scope, assessment level, revision, and expiration. The white area is where the main conformity declaration lies. On the back of the certificate, or on the right-hand side of the screen, once again, you have a gray area and a white area. The gray area is the certification, or the certificate template, and the white area is where you will find failure rates and supporting documentation. So we're going to start on this screen from left to right and work our way through the certificate now. So starting with the scope, assessment level, revision, and expiration. At the very bottom of the scope, assessment level, revision, and expiration section, you will see our ANSI logo. And this is the American National Standards Institute. Um, this indicates that the certificate was a result of an assessment program that was accredited by ANSI. And ANSI is a part of the International Accreditation Forum, which is the IAF, and an assessment program that is accredited by the organization that is part of an 
IAF is automatically accepted by all countries that have similar organizations that are part of the IAF. So as you can see on the screen, this is just a couple of examples. They, the United Kingdom has their own um, accreditation party in the IAF, the Netherlands, Germany, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. The list goes on and on and on. But once you are a part of or um, accredited by ANSI or the IAF, you are then accepted in all of these countries. Um, putting the ANSI logo at the bottom of our certificate is actually a new um, thing on the latest template that we are doing. So if you do see older Exodus certificates, they might not have this ANSI logo on, and that's okay. Um, don't just assume that because they're missing the ANSI logo, they are not valid or they're a counterfeit certificate. That's just not necessarily true. Um, this is something that we started about last year and we will be continuing to do so. The next se section is in the middle and it is the scope and assessment level. The certificate shows the Exodus cert certification mark that is that the manufacturer may use. So the certification mark documents the scope as well as the achieved assessment level. So looking at this example, we see that the mark displays IEC 61508 as the scope, as well as it's still three capable, and that's the achievement level. So reading through this specific case means that the product is considered to pass Exeter IEC 61508 assessment scheme up to a still three capable level. And I'll explain more about the SIL capability in the main conformity declaration um, section, so don't worry about that quite yet. Next, we're going to look at the revision and expiration section, and that is right below the certification mark. The revision of the certific certificate defines the version of the certificate and the date that the certificate was issued. The latest certificate is always available from the Exodus website or the SAEL. The valid till until date identifies when the certificate expires. The Exodus IEC 61508 assessment scheme allows manufacturers to make modifications to their products, provided that the manufacturer follows the audited and assessed um, or the modification portion of the development process. When a certificate expires, the manufacturer will then need to renew the certificate by coming to Exeter. At this point in time, Exeter will perform a surveillance audit, and the surveillance audit includes review of all engineering changes as well as field return information. The engineering routine changes are reviewed in detail to ensure that the impact analysis were created and the appropriate retesting was completed with full validation testing for each release after the initial certification. If the surveillance audit shows that the manufacturer did not follow the audited and assessed development process, the cert certificate is in question as well as any other certificates issued by that same manufacturer. And they will be withdrawn. And Exodus assessment scheme requires that this is done by the removal of the Exodus website or the SAEL and possibly combined with a press release letting your customers know that this is no longer considered a still capable device or a safety system device. If the certificate does not have an expiration date, it means that the manufacturer is not allowed to make any changes on the product without a full recertification. This means that the certificate not only applies to the, or the, it only applies to the exact hardware and or software versions of the product that were in place when the product was evaluated during the assessment. And this is an indication that the manufacturer is not capable of making quality changes to the product. 
The next section we're going to look at is the main conformity declaration. This is the second part of the Exeter certificate, and it's the front page, the white section, as we saw in the beginning. It defines the product was the, the product that was assessed, the standards considered, and the achieved assessment level. So the first thing we look at is the certificate number. And this is a special code which is unique for each certificate. It's going to start with three letters followed by seven numbers. Then the letter C and three number identifier afterwards. Next is the product in the manufacturer. So the product and manufacturer section defines the product that was evaluated as part of the assessment as well as the manufacturer of that product. If a specific product is sold by multiple manufacturers, the certification of that product for the manufacturer A does not automatically mean the certi certification for manufacturer B is also applied. There are requirements that each manufacturer would need to meet, such as Manufacturer A might have a different return process or customer notification process or many other different things that we consider. So always look at the exact um, manufacturer and the exact product is always listed on the front of the certificate. Next we're going to look at the standards and the assessment level section. The relevant standards will be IEC 61508, the 2010 version, parts 1 through 7 for the Exeter IEC 61508 assessment scheme. Though parts 5, 6, and 7 are only informative, they are still part of the overall standard that is being considered as part of the certification. Furthermore, if a non-software-based product is assessed, the specific software development requirements will be excluded as part of the compliance documentation. However, Part 3 of the standard is still being considered during the assessment. IEC 61508 contains requirements that relates to the development process quality system that a manufacturer uses as well as a product-specific performance requirement. And we're going to look at those two um, sections right now. We break them apart into development process and quality system requirements and then the second part, the product specific performance requirements. So the first section we look at is what we consider the systematic capability. And the development process and quality system requirements are referenced to as the systematic requirements. These requirements will depend on the SIL level for which a product is certified. So the higher the SIL level, the more stringent the requirements become. An example of this would be for a software architectural design. Um, fault detection is not required for SIL 1. It is recommended for SIL 2 and it's highly recommended for SIL 3. The systematic capability increases the level of the development process and quality system considered during the IEC 61508 assessment. The product that has a systematic capability of SIL 3, the development process considered must meet the requirements of IEC 61508 SIL 3. As a result, the product can be used in a SIL 3 application. A product with a systematic capability of only SIL 2 would not would mean that they can only be used up to SIL 2. So you can use it in a SIL 1 application or SIL 2, but not SIL 3. But please, please know that a SIL capability of a SIL 3 does not automatically mean that the product can be used without any redundancy in a SIL 3 application. We'll talk more about that in a second. The next section was the product specific performance requirements or the random capability. 
there are two aspects to the random failure requirements. The probability of failure for an entire SIF and the minimum hardware fault tolerance for the element. So the probability of failure limits are either expressed in an average probability of failure on demand for a low demand application, which many safety related systems are, or the frequency of dangerous failures for a high or a continuous demand application. Both limits apply to the entire SIF and as such one cannot conclude that the achieved SIL level based on the probability of failure for a single product. The Exeter certificate will therefore specify that the probability of failure must be verified for each application. The minimum hardware fault tolerance or the architectural constraints for an entire element can be specified provided that the product under consideration may constitute a complete element. An actuator, for an example, is only a component of that is part of the element, in which case no achieved SIL level can be concluded. So as part of a random capability claim, the certificate will list what equipment type and category it belongs to, um, such as a type A or a type B. If the product under the consideration constitutes a complete element, such as a transmitter, the certificate will state up to what SIL level the product can be used without any hardware fault tolerance, and you can see that up there as HFT equals to zero, and up to what SIL level a product can be used with hardware fault tolerance of one, or HFT equals one. For a minimum hardware fault tolerance and for all architectural constraints, there are two alternative methods that can be applied per IEC 61508. These two alternative methods are called Route 1H and Route 2H, and the certificate will identify which method is applied for the product under consideration. Next, we go to the safety function and the application restrictions. And this is a very important part of the certificate that um, we feel that a lot of people just glance over or don't even read at all. So a product is certified for a given safety function. The certificate is only valid if the product is used within the constraints of the published safety function. So for a shutoff valve, for example, um, it will most likely only be certified for on-off applications, excluding the assessment for controller or control function applications. In addition to restrictions regarding the function performed by the product, there are most likely also restrictions with regard to the overall application of the product. These restrictions will include the environmental restrictions, among others. All restrictions must be documented in the product safety manual. Next we go on to the assessors. So for the Exeter assessment scheme, it requires that two independent assessors evaluate the product's compliance to the particular standard. So you have an evaluating assessor who performs the majority of the assessment activities including a detailed product evaluation through an FMEDA, software architecture through software criticality analysis, as well as a detailed review of the, of the assessment scheme requirements and arguments why those requirements are met by the product under consideration. The result of the assessment work is a detailed safety case, which we discussed in how to get the certificate. Next, you have the certifying assessor, which they establish an independent review of the product and the manufacturer's development process and quality system. So the certifying assessor also reviews the work performed by the evaluating assessor to ensure the completeness of the safety case of the product. And both assessors must sign off on the assessment. So for the um, certificate and the certifying process to be complete, the certificate must have two signatures on the bottom. 
of the front page. Next, we're going to look at the certificate template. And this is the back side of the certificate in the gray area. So the bottom of the certificate template section will show the certificate template number and the revision. Exeda's assessment scheme is continuously evaluated and updated whenever necessary. So the version number of the template is an indication why some certificates for a similar product may look a little bit different. The product name is also displayed in this gray section in the middle of the certificate template section to clarify and clearly indicate that this second page of the certificate belongs to the front page of the certificate. So you will always see the model number and the company name there in white. The next section is the failure rates and supporting documentation section. The final part of this is the back section, the white portion. And it addresses the failure rates and supporting documentation. It defines failure rates of the product that was assessed as well as key documentation involved in the assessment. So in the middle of the page, you will find failure rates. The probability of failure of a safety instrumented function or a SIF will depend on a variety of parameters, including proof test interval, proof test coverage, mission time, only to name a few. The publishing of the probability of failure numbers implies that mandatory test intervals and procedures were followed and will be followed. Since a product can be applied in a variety of applications for a variety of safety and integrity level requirements, the final probability of failure can only be determined by the end user. As such, the failure rates are published as these allow end users to account for all of the application specific parameters that the impact overall the product safety. So the failure rates are published in safe or dangerous in detected and undetected category with detailed definitions specified in the assessment report and the FMEDA report. For final elements, two sets of numbers are specified. Um, you will have normal application failure rates and sometimes, if applicable, partial stroke test application failure rates. The um, partial stroke test application failure rates represents how the failure rates of a product would change if a partial stroke test is applied. So the definition of a partial stroke test is included in the assessment report. And the partial stroke test failure rates can only be claimed if a partial stroke test device is implemented per partial stroke test definition. And finally, we're going to go into the supporting documentation, which is at the bottom of the back page of the white section. This will list the assessment report and the safety manual for your reference. As described in the beginning of this webinar, Exeda posts both the certificate and assessment report on the SAEL website. The safety manual for the product is issued by a manufacturer and should be obtained by the manufacturer. No, be obtained from the manufacturer. Exeda urges users to obtain the safety manual before actually acquiring a specific product as the safety manual will dictate the restrictions that apply to the product for the cert certification for it to be valid. The safety manual is a document that we review several times here at Exeda, and it's a very important part of the certification process. So now we're going to get into some examples and how you can yourself interpret Exeda certifications. Before I show you any examples, just let me be clear. 
these examples are not favored. They're not the best of what Exodus sees. These were just randomly picked out of the SAEL because they had the updated template and format. So if this is or is not your example, I'm sorry. Okay, level transmitter. Let's first take a look here and let me find my little highlighter. Here we go. Let's first take a look at the SIL capability mark right here. So this is showing Sorry, let me see if it, the slideshow re will resume or not. It doesn't look like it. Let me try this again. Okay, can we see the slideshow again? Okay, we're back up. Once again, sorry about that. Okay. For some reason, every time I try and go to the spotlight, it is kicking me out. So we're no longer going to do the highlighter, and you will just have to follow me. So let's first take a look at the front of the page in the gray section. You're going to look at the SIL capability, and as you can see, this has this digital, this level transmitter passed IEC 61508 at a SIL-3 capable level. Below that is our expiration date. As you can see, this certificate is valid until December 1st, 2017, so it has more recently been updated. On the front here, you can see that we have the safety function and application restrictions, along with two signatures. On the back, let's take a look. We have the failure rates, along with the supporting documentation of the assessment report and the safety manual. So let's go ahead to a digital valve positioner. Here we go. Once again, let's start at the front. We have 61508 SIL-3 capable product. It is valid until October 1st of 2016. We not only have the exact title of the product, but also who makes it and where. We have the safety function and the application restrictions along with two signatures. On the back, once again, we have the product. Then we have the failure rates and supporting documents, the safety manual, the assessment report. But if you take a look here, you can see that it is this, the failure rates are listed in a normal mode and with partial valve stroke testing. And partial valve stroke testing is usually shown with final elements. So in this case, this product, if you do a partial valve stroke test, you can detect some of the lambda DUs or the dangerous undetected failure rates and the safe undetected failure rates and turn them into dangerous detected or safe detected from undetected. That's great. But we get asked, how do we know that? Well, we go into each product and evaluate each product in a lot of detail and look at the individual components. And we look at, okay, what if a partial valve stroke test happens? Will we detect this particular product failure or this particular component failure? And if so, will it will be a detected failure instead of an undetected failure from that point with a complete partial valve stroke test. And the next example is a gate valve. So once again, 61508, still three capable. 
It's valid until December 1, 2017. We have our company, where they are located, and the product. And we have the safety function and two signatures on the front. Looking good. We head to the back. We have the product in the gray section along with um, failure rates. A normal mode and partial valve stroke testing were um, suitable for this application along with the assessment report and the safety manual. So next we're going to look at certification validity. So there are many wonderful things with success, but there are some not so great things that come with success. So our certification program is very successful. Um, our Certificates and certification program is recognized worldwide. <laughs> you can't say that. Um, end users recognize Exida application knowledge, and manufacturers realize that it's not just a rubber stamp. It's actually work behind it, and it means something. Along with that, we have um, not all manufacturers or products pass. So what happens when that happens? Not always easy. It's not always nice. Um, not all products will pass. We offer the gap reports or the action item lists, and some companies don't want to put in the effort to clean up the gaps or the action items to make their product and their process a SIL certified um, to be up to IEC 61508 compliance. So what happens in that case? Um, unfortunately, we have seen some companies decide to be self-certified in 61508 and go around saying that they're SIL 2 or even SIL 3, even though they are clearly not. Um, on top of that, Another downside is we find counterfeit certificates out on the market. Here are three recent examples that we have found. Um, it could be the companies themselves making the certificates, which we certainly hope not. Um, it also could be um, some sales rep saying that they need a certificate, boom, put on a name, and there you go. We are finding more and more of these. So how do you know it's real? What do you do? So as I said already, Exeter posts all product certificates and assessment reports on the SAEL website. So you can always go there and make sure. Um, you can, it's an actual, it was very easy um, website to navigate. You can have it um, sorted by product or you can actually search throughout it. So if you're looking for um, your company, you can type it in. You can search by component or element. Or we've actually had many people come up to me. I had one come up to me at a trade show and say, I'm looking for this type of element or component. How do I know who is certified and who isn't? And I told them, simply go to the SAEL. You can say, I'm looking for a ball valve, and pull up ball valve, and all of the companies that are certified come up. And you can pick one out of that where you can see the assessment report and the certificate. So it makes some really easy decisions, and it's great for your customers. So now, how does all of this Come back to compliance. How does the exit certificate relate to compliance? And there are three steps to complete compliance and three requirements. You have your SIL capability, you have your probability of failure, and your architectural constraints. So in order to have compliance, all of those need to meet nightly in the middle. If you have two out of three, you might be doing good, but it's not enough. 
So taking a look at the Exeter Certificate with Compliance. Um, an easy way to look is that little box with Systematic Capability and Random Capability. You have your SIL capability there, and right below it says the um, PFD average and architectural constraints must be verified for each application. So it says right on the certificate what you can be and what, you are, what the product is capable of, but you have to look at the entire SIF design. Oh, I forgot. There we go. So um, at this point, um, I'm going to ask if there's any questions that I have not seen. I haven't seen any of them yet. So, um, And if you think of questions later, please feel free to email me. Um, it's something that I don't mind, and hopefully I can answer any of the questions that you have. Um, let me pull this out and see if I have any questions currently. It says no. Oh, wait. Um, okay, these questions didn't show up before until I clicked into it. I'm sorry. Okay, the first question we had, I didn't notice this earlier, I'm very sorry, like I said, we're using a new software, so please uh, bear with me. Um, the first question that I received was, when my certificate expires, how do I renew? You can contact um, anyone at Exida, and we will be able to get you a quote. We go through this um, surveillance audit, and we will walk you through um, we can walk you through the certification process. Um, we would do another on-site audit. We would ask you for your engineering changes. Um, make sure your safety manual is up to date and has everything that we need and that you're giving the safety manual out to anyone that needs it. Um, the next one, does Exeter certify software to IEC 61508? And the answer is yes, we certify software to IEC 61508. So if you have any questions about that, you can email me or anybody else at Exida and we can help you out. Oh, I just got one about my mic being overdriven a bit. I'm sorry I did not see that until now. That would have been helpful. Um, the next one is um, IEC 61508 applies to electronic equipment. How come Exeter issues a certificate for a gate valve? IEC 61508 applies to both electronic and mechanical equipment um, just because um, it simply, it's, it applies to mechanical equipment also. Um, anything in a safety loop is considered IEC 61508 qualified, and anything in the safety loop we make sure is compliant. Um, so any, even if it is a simple mechanical device such as a gate valve, we um, do in fact certify. Um, the next question I have is, control systems like Honeywell or Invensys are certified by Exeter. Um, the answer is, I, I, I believe you're asking, are they certified by Exeter? And um, we do have um, Honeywell certified and different control systems and different products by Honeywell certified. So it is something that we do um, do and we can do, yes. Uh, 
Um, I don't believe I have any other questions at this time. Oh. And I had a comment that um, the Invincis is, the Triconix is certified by TUV Brian Lillen. Okay. I was not familiar by the Invincis uh, Triconix um, control system. So thank you very much. Um, the next question I have is, I'm looking at a certificate specifically of proven and use heading. The only reference is to shipment records for validation. Does this factor in safe and dangerous failures? Is there a further document referring to application and performance? Are there audits to performed to ensure hardware is not thrown out? Um, okay, let me break this down step by step. Um, I guess my first question to you is, is it an Exodus certificate? Because even the old Exodus certificates will have, um, they will refer to application and um, the performance. Um, so you will have your safety function and application restrictions involved. Um, I don't believe that even old Exodus certificates only say proven in use on them. Um, it could be a 2H heading, which we have, but once again, we still have safety functions and performance restrictions on our certificate. As well on the back, um, we have um, the failure rates. In an Exodus certificate, even if it is a proven in use um, justification, we do we do um, FAMITAs, we do have safe and dangerous failures, um, we do look at the application, we do look at the um, performance, and we make sure that everything is covered. Um, just because it is proven in use, we um, qualify the whole process and the whole product. Proven in use is just a part of the compliance, and it would not be complete compliance. So um, if that is um, an Exodus certificate you're looking at, I would assume that it might be a counterfeit certificate. I don't, um, do you have a cert number? Do you have a um, company record? Because I can look it up on the SAEL and get more information for you. Um, so if you could give me any more information, it might be able to help you or guide you through this a little bit better as an example. But um, Exodus certification always looks at um, failure rates. We definitely. Okay, we have a number. It is VEL 1405020REV003. Um, so let me look this up on our SAEL quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a VELOG certificate. And that is a, um, it is an Exodus certificate. And it is a, um, On the back of the certificate will have the um, failure rates. So if um, if you'd like to email me, um, I can give you more information about it. Um, so email me afterwards, and I'll be able to help you out more um, in that case. Um, if there's any more questions, I'm going to um, please feel free to email me and let me know any more that you have. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining.